Well, mm -hmm. that's that's another layer. I like I would like that personally, but um, you know, that might not fly. I mean, you know, I, I I'm not so much in favor of this as I think it's a it's a worthy topic that uh it, it challenges our both our intelligence and our judgment. Thank you. Um thanks, John. Okay. This 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 is the uh OGM weekly call for Thursday, March 14th, 2024. Uh we are, um, it's a topic week. Last week was a check-in week. This is a topic week. We don't have an agreed on topic. So floor is open for topics. And John Kelly was just proposing a presidential competency test of some sort as a topic. And uh, I'm eager to hear other things that people would like to talk about. Um, we could also, um, the, the last of the governance calls is after this call, a half hour after we're done here at 10 a.m. Pacific today, uh, same Zoom. And Gil had asked in the last one, how do we prevent the train wreck of uh, a second Trump administration, which we could make a topic for this call if we wanted to. Um, so that's a second proposal. Uh, the floor is open for others. Uh, Mike. I always have 17 different topics, but- You uh, do, can you boil them down? Well, let me throw out two. Um, I, I love the topic of how do we prevent autocracy and specifically Donald Trump, but I, I would suggest that we should push that off by two or three months until we have a better sense of the landscape. Because um, Although maybe it does require we start right now to change everything, but it, it it really things are changing so fast that whatever plans we come up with now probably will be overcome by events by by May. But the topic I'd like to throw out is incredibly timely because yesterday the House of Representatives voted almost unanimously. I think there were sixty six people who decided they didn't want to ban TikTok. But I, I'd love to know what people think about this question, uh, about whether we're going to be able to live in a world where apps built in one country can be used in all countries. Because the trend right now is uh, put up the moats, put up the uh, the barriers. You know, we don't want our data being used elsewhere. We're paranoid about even buying Chinese subway cars. So I, I, I love love thoughts on this. And I'm, I'll put my biases up front. I, I, I abhor the idea of data localization. And I really get upset when I can't use apps in one country that I'm used to using. But I'd love to have thoughts on how do we change this conversation? Because otherwise, the splinter net will be a reality by next year. Um. Love that thought. And and um, so this is a silly question because I sort of scanned the articles and wasn't really paying attention to the TikTok thing. Is the bill actually to ban TikTok in the US or is the bill to force TikTok to sell TikTok US or get well, Both. Okay. They, so, they will but, be banned if they do not divest in 180 days. Right. So if they, if they divest. Well impossible. <laughs> right. So, so if they divest, then TikTok could stay alive in the country kind of thing. Okay. But but China won't let them divest. Yeah, well, it's a it's a it's a showdown at the OK Corral. Um, yeah. Gil, okay. Gil is talking one of but... one of one of many yet to come. Um, one of many sh such showdowns, you mean? Showdown. We're in showdown time. Yeah, there'll be a lot of showdown happening. Um, 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 yeah, on the TikTok thing, as I yeah, I, I also abhor. Um, Mike, what was the term you used for data? Um, data localization. Data localization. I, I, I abhor that also. Um, um, and the concern here is surveillance capitalism on Chinese Communist Party steroids. <laughs> the best of both worlds. <laughs> there you go. So there's, So it's an interesting question. Let's come back to that. On the, uh, on the election thing, I agree, Mike. Basically, I agree with your suggestion to push it off for a couple of two, three months. Uh, but it's not like there's nothing to do now. People are already cranking up the voter registration machines, the get out vote activity, the organ. You know, the, there's a lot of really fascinating grassroots organizing happening, uh, and um, um, including enormous activation of young voters. So there are things happening now. Uh, for our purposes, it may make sense to wait. I don't know. 
and it, it, the whole TikTok thing really does present a dilemma, uh, a, a very interesting dilemma. Because on the one hand, uh, do you let do you let the Chinese government keep having its nose under the tent, or on the other hand, do you start banning social media apps and start the splinter net? Uh, and it, I don't think either I don't think either side is that fun an outcome. Mm -hmm. Maybe the larger problem is not uh, who owns TikTok and so on, but the the uh, interference into our elections through manipulation that's that's uh, uh, going through the algorithms that are, that are directing uh, networks like TikTok and Facebook. And so when you have a foreign government, which uh, is not friendly to, to our government, uh, <clears throat> maybe have you know, uh, an influence or over directing these algorithms, that's a real national security risk. I mean, that's for real. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and, and, and potentially messing with our elections. So somehow there has to be an assurance of some sort, whichever way that takes place, that the algorithms are clean and transparent. Uh, and, and not direct, uh, directed towards re-electing Donald Trump as an example. Or whichever direction. Um, other suggestions for topics we would like to talk about? So we want we want these hot topics, these hot present topics. We don't have an, anything more casual or relaxed. We don't want to talk about uh, the difference between iambic pentameter and haiku or. <laughs> We know the difference, Jerry, but we can argue about which one's better. <laughs> Jerry, we had we we just had a, an unusual um, moment of silence of a sort that I can't remember ever having in OGM, where you asked the question and nobody had an answer. And um, um, maybe you were uncomfortable with that, but maybe just let that sit for a while. Oh, I, I wasn't uncomfortable. I was just like it, it was present for me that yeah. all, all yeah. of our topics are these these sort of hot political whatever kind of topics. And I'm like, does anybody want to go a different direction? That's all. Yeah. I'd like to go a different direction, but it, <clears throat> the reason for not uh, speaking up was a sense that everybody's sort of feeling this energy to to talk about these uh, these hot topics. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not wedded to TikTok. I, I'm interested, but I'm not wedded to yeah. it. The, the issue is um, not going away. So if you've got something else, <laughs> forward. and if nothing else, we'll all bring it up next time. So, yeah, I just I keep with each and every one of our conversations. I keep uh, thinking how how do we uh, address long term transformation in our society when what we're always excited about and wanting to deal with is today's news uh what what what's the thing is it the politics is it the what's happening in the courts is it what's happening in um, at uh, at the in congress so for me kind of thinking about big picture transformation is the only way that we're going to get out of this mess rather than dealing with the, the hot potato of the day but uh that that's me so well, I, I, as a futurist and a person who's been thinking about these issues for 35 years, I have a real fondness for long-term thinking. And I, I, I think I've mentioned I'm on the board of the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation, and our mission is to spur future thinking, you know, 2040, you know. That's all? I, 2040? I, I think I answered your question with my proposed topic, because the way that we get people to focus on the big issues and how we could fix things in the long term is to look at the thorny questions right now that have to be addressed if we're going to get to the long term. So the, the the TikTok thing is is controversial, emotional, it's getting lots of coverage, but the core issue which is do we have an open global mind? That's a 25-year-old issue. That does sound very core. <laughs> I, I think it's about as core as it gets. <laughs> Um, and before I pass the mic to Doug, uh, I want to propose a different kind of issue and I need to find, actually, let me pass it to Doug and then I'll, I'll put a different uh, topic on the table as well. Go ahead, Doug. So, um, the topic I, I put on the table, um, which is the tip of a larger iceberg is, uh, the concept of neurodiversity. 
And um, the expansion on that is um, my shifting orientation into uh, neurodiversity as the all-inclusive of all um, human wiring, representing the larger bell curve, as it were, and the tyranny of a very small slice of that bell curve, also known as normative, over everybody. Um, and that being a key ingredient in the how do we transform or how do we catalyze an awakening, a reawakening, reconnecting of 8 billion plus human beings in a relatively spontaneous time frame um, to their own humanity, sort of reconnecting with ourselves as living beings as a step toward changing what we then are doing in relation to each other and the planet. And I'm complete. Um, thanks, Doug. Uh, neurodiversity and its sequelae and its implications. And I'm just as a short. I'm I'm um, wondering if neurodiversity is being diluted, uh, just as organic and natural and uh, open and other sorts of terms seem to have been diluted over time. Um, and I'm I'm wondering. That would be an interesting conversation as well. Um, the thing I was going to propose was uh, Jonathan Haidt has a new book coming out. Uh, and I'm actually uh, not finding the title right away, but he wrote an Atlantic article, which I'll post in the chat, uh, the, about the mental effect, the terrible costs of a phone-based childhood is basically the title of the piece. And uh, he's, I think, and I've not read the piece or the book, but I think he's proposing that we just uh, not let kids have phones because the phones are tearing a hole in our youth's mental health, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm uncomfortable with that proposal as well. Um, I think there are other ways of solving that problem perhaps, but it, that's another dilemma that I think is uh, in front of us. And uh, if the next generations have been abducted from society by algorithmic culture, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that's probably a problem. Yeah. Um, Stacy, please. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up because um, going back to the TikTok thing, I wanted to share that there are a number of people that, you know, like regular lay people that are having the conversations that are focused on something totally different and arguing about it. And I thought that that discussion, having that discussion would move into what Jose wants to do, how do we do us? Because that could be an example where we're taking all these divergent opinions. And I mean, everything that was mentioned today, I think could all fit in within the confines of all the different topics that were thrown out, with the exception of maybe the competency test that John brought up. But talking about TikTok and talking about what different people are thinking and how to pull all the pieces out um, for example, like so, so they were saying how like in China, the kids can't even use TikTok or they can use it, but it's only like if they put on TikTok, they will learn about science or something like that. And what's important to me is not so much who can make that decision, but why aren't we even holding our United States companies to higher standards and maybe have the conversation in that way because in each of the camps, there's going to be different people in each on each side for different reasons. And sometimes as we talk about it and separate the different issues, we'll notice different groupings of people. And we could start by doing that in our own circle as the practice of how do we do ourselves differently. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. And I think there is this uh, there is this problem within the problem behind the problem under the problem kind of problem that we often face in our conversations. It's like, what, where, where do you start digging? Uh, where do you put the spade in? Um, and I think we differ in interesting ways on that question. And in some sense, us 
always by sort of winding up back at that question has us chasing our tail a bit and uh, uh, making less progress than we might otherwise. Um, so a thought. Uh, it seems like we had a rough consensus on topic. Um, do we want to head back toward the TikTok dilemma or which one? I have a, a quick comment, um, uh, which I mean to be constructive. I, uh, uh, I'm i biased to be spending my time towards, well, um, maybe anti-biased to spend time towards uh, uh, confabulating about big things which we won't change. Um, and I'm much more interested in understanding how we might scale our um, effectiveness. Um, so, you know, it, it seems really, for me at least, it seems really abstract to talk about the presidency um, and not be talking about how people like us might affect the course of uh, the, the government uh, or the presidency. Kind of a similar thing with, you know, it's interesting to, I mean, it's interesting to kvetch about um, TikTok or Facebook. I love to kvetch about Facebook, but um, without actually doing something to, to make a change, uh, you know, that I believe in, I, you know, the kvetching is just kvetching. I, I, I have a topic which I can't support, which is, uh, yeah, um, which is personal bravery. Uh, I, I came to this uh, in a weird way. One of them was Jordan Zukut. Um, uh, and he and I were talking about the difference between a safe space where and no one gets hurt and a brave space where people take um, uh, take agency over, you know, their their uh, being in the space. And, and uh, thinking I'm teaching people how to use AI uh, in different ways. And one of the things that I find really amazing about working with an AI uh, assistant is that it lets me be more brave personally um, to, to do something that I wouldn't do otherwise because I have uh, a neutral helper um, giving me a little bit of platform to be able to stand on in a place where I, I couldn't otherwise. And conversely, um, a lot of the people who start with AI um, it, it takes a lot of bravery to go, I'm going to jump into kind of an unknown thing and start doing stuff without really understanding what's going on or things like that. So, um, so for me, the, there's a, the, this, a scale thing, you know, um, I, I, I would like talking about big things, but, um, I don't like talking about big things if we're not going to just make a change somehow changes. Thanks. Thanks Pete. Um, I appreciate that a lot. And I think uh, how might we um, scale our effectiveness is a really interesting topic. Doug C. Yeah, I think our frame here is often to fix things. And fix means putting it kind of back where it was. If the situation is just too complicated, fixing is not a plausible path. Uh, some form of collapse is probably ine inevitable. And new things, unimagined, will emerge out of that. Thanks, Doug. Um, and I, for one, am a fan of thinking through and beyond the problems as much as possible. Um, Gil? Uh, Um, yeah, uh, agree with Doug on fixing things, but on the matter of big things that we keep talking about, um, do we have any idea about how big changes actually happen? There's a bunch of theories about them, yes. We keep talking about wanting to make big changes, but uh, I th I'd like to explore how big things actually happen. It's, a myster it's mysterious and emerging process to my mind. And so... Um, uh, yeah, so this I, I vary on this, but this morning, at least, the notion of going after big things without asking that question feels foolish. Um, thanks. Go ahead, Mike. And just to provide a little more focus to the question on how the TikTok bill, um, first off, a show of hands, how many people would have voted 
for the bill that passed yesterday. So show, show your hand if you're okay. Stacy's got the right expression. Klaus, yes. How many people would have voted against it? Mike, Mike, I'm really old fashioned. I kind of think that people shouldn't vote on bills without reading them. Which seems <laughs> Okay. That's another good instinct. It Which seems like we have, question, a, right? we, we have a we have a consensus that they could have done better. I think that we we pro Klaus would probably agree that they could have done better. But um, the the thought I had, and it ties into what Gil just said about how do big changes happen. I would argue that quite often the big change process happens by embedding a new phrase tied to a new concept into the brains of millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of people. And I think that's what we're really, really desperately in need of when it comes to this question of data sovereignty, digital sovereignty, data localization, keep out the bad apps. I mean, there, there, there has to be a better way of thinking about what's going on and it's it's not the word globalization didn't work very well and digital globalization would be even worse but maybe that's where we start with this we're not going to rewrite the legislation but if we were to unleash even two sentences in a tweet that kind of got people to say there's another way rather than thinking of this as a trade issue and you know, the need for Fortress America, the need to keep things out. Open global mind is actually not bad when it comes to this, because, you know, that that is this idea that we're all sharing information and we're collaborating. But I, I, it, I, I would I would benefit hugely from that discussion. And I think the uh, Congress would as well, and particularly the senators who are now going to have to come up with an explanation as to why. 80, you know, they're not going to vote 85% in favor of the TikTok bill. Klaus. Yeah, I think the, the, the struggle that that uh, is, is expressed with this TikTok ban uh, really is the, 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 uh, the understanding how powerful these media really are in influencing and shaping public opinion. So shaping shaping mindsets, uh, and no one really has an answer for it. And you would hope that uh, Zuckerberg and, uh, and Elon Musk and others come to their senses and understand that collectively we have to pull together and respond to the challenges that we're facing from a changing environment that we need to create adaptations and mitigations uh, that can only be accomplished in a collective uh, a form because everyone has to be on board and participate. And to understand the 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 uh, dangers in our future, in our collective future, not in ways that paralyze or you know, create create uh, you know, trauma or whatever, but to really understand um, our personal individual role in it and these networks absolutely have the capacity to do that and they can do it in a way that is positive and encouraging and and uh, uh um in a can do kind of mode right but we don't we 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 do completely idiotic things uh, on on these networks and focus on uh, on issue, on things that are that are just you know, a, a waste of mental energy. I mean, in my mind, I'm sorry, but it, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's just like Stacy mentioned. You know, in China, they're using TikTok to encourage children to learn you know, to to engage with uh, uh, topics that are that are would be considered beneficial in nature and you know, still individualized and so on. But it's like learn something. And here we are just, uh, uh, I mean, these kids are getting into the most extreme uh, uh, topics that, that are just, at the end, destructive, but they consume them, you know, their, their minds. So that's really the challenge. And I think that's what, uh, deep down, everyone is struggling with, you know, is to is to bang on these networks to do something different, but just don't know how to really do it. Um, and so 
that's, I think, how do we and our for our personal influence, how can you reach out to as many people as possible to bring to bring attention to uh, this future that is unfolding right around us and uh, has some very inevitable consequences that are not that far into our future you know, in our distance. And so I think that's that's sort of the bigger question. how do you how do you touch? People who direct and 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 own these networks in ways that that has them accept the responsibility that comes with what they have created here, which is fantastic in some sense, amazing potentials, but then misused in ways that is just shocking, really. Yeah. Um, thanks, Klaus. Uh, John, then Ken, then me, then Mike, then Doug. Let's see, Doug B. So go ahead, John. Okay, so um, there was a made-for-TV movie, oh, this is really old, maybe 20 years ago. It had a title, a vague title, something like Earth 2. And there was a, it was a community in orbit. <clears throat> and it was discovered that, you know, in the, in the, the satellite had been put together with international cooperation. And somehow there was, it turned out that there was a bomb, you know, a nuclear bomb on either near or adjacent to the satellite and so there was a big you know controversy about well how th this should not be allowed this can't happen blah, blah 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 you know and so on and so forth as they were having the debate on video there was this little ticker at the bottom and it would say things like the use of the word bomb might be to you know it is emotional and you know basically it was like a it was like a real time John, you're breaking and up. When now. I saw that, I said, "Okay." When I saw, did you get that the real time critical uh, analysis? No. Of the why debate? don't Why don't you turn off your video and go back two sentences if you can in your head and and because uh, you you were just okay. get you were just getting rolling there, but we lost we, the the your audio got garbled. Let me turn off the turn off the video. Hold on. Thanks. The word bomb was coming across the. Yes, uh, you talked page. about the ticker and the word yeah. bomb. The, the, so the so the person in the debate, the person on the screen was was getting you know agitated and was saying using the word bomb to get people to uh, object. And this ticker across the bottom said the use of the word bomb, you know, maybe to is emotional and you know may uh, you know sway your opinion. And I thought immediately, wow, <laughs> do I want that tick? I mean, it's bad. It is. It's not accurate. It would be very hard to do in real time, but wow, what a tool. And um, so if we just roll that forward to the present, what comes to mind as a possibility is an overlay. And it's an overlay, it, it would be really, really hard to do, and we would need really good AI to do this. But you can imagine a voluntary overlay. And it, a parent could decide to do this for their children. Uh, anybody else could decide to do this. People could decide, oh, this is, a, this is like in large type. This is a, a digital literacy enhancer. And what it would do is it would, it would seek to detect and filter what's going on with the algorithm that's presenting you whatever it's presenting you. Um, you know, it's, it's an ambitious idea. Uh, I can I can see all kinds of challenges in in getting it to work, but I think it's what's interesting about the idea is that that people could voluntarily adopt it, and it wouldn't require the consent of the corporation that was sending you the images. Other than there, I'm sure there'd be a battle in the courts to say, "Oh, wait a minute, you're you're editing my work." in real time. Well, yes, and you're doing the same thing. So, you know, here we go. Let's work it out. <laughs> All right. I mean, it's a very fragmentary idea, but I think you got enough pieces of it there to uh, to work with it. I kind Thank of pa I paraphrased a piece of your idea as training wheels for better discourse. Like how might we get systems to help steer us back toward reasonableness with each other or whatever else. But uh, yeah, uh, thanks, John. Um, okay. Ken. Thank you. 
So a um, couple things come to mind. One is I was on a call with the Focus for Democracy people the other day. Anybody know Focus for Democracy here? Okay, you'll you'll hear about them soon. I'm going to um, send you all an invitation for an upcoming call. They really, uh, it's another group that that um, looks at specific races and how can we target dollars so that it will make the biggest difference. Um, and they had uh, two people on there, one from um, Accelerate Change and another from, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but turns out that, uh, that the large, who knows what the largest source of news is for people today? Maybe you want to take a guess? What age? Everyone, but specifically younger people. TikTok. 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 And uh, they own a company that has like eight different platforms and they're the largest news supplier and they happen to be progressive, which leads me to believe that maybe one reason that the bill for TikTok for being banned is that the right realizes these people are way ahead of us on social media. Now the right is way ahead of us on old school media, you know, the whole AM dial, the lower part of the AM dial and, you know, one news, Amer one American news network and all that stuff. So how does big change happen through advertising is one enormous way of, making big change happen. People who spend billions of dollars to fund incredible campaigns that are very persuasive to people, whether they're based on um, fact or fiction, doesn't seem to matter. So my question is, what constitutes a viable source of good, credible information? And what are those sources for you? Um, because I think it'd be really worth um, knowing that and exploring that. You know, there's, there's so many sources of information. I get all kinds of stuff emailed to me every day and you know, I see stuff that, that is absolute bullshit and that looks really credible to me. And how do you decide? So at the heart of all this seems to be where are you getting your source? Where's your source of information? How credible are they? Why do you trust them? What would make you um, want to uh, switch? And how can we amplify people who are and sources who are really worthy and start to turn down, increase the signal to noise ratio against all the bullshit that's out, out there? Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Um, I'm going to be quiet for a moment, and then I want to come back and maybe synthesize a little bit um, from what Pete said, but also what other people have said. So let's go into sounds for a second. We could have a, a call where we perform John Cage's piece, four minutes, 33 seconds. <laughs> um, that'd be kind of fun. At least we'd know how long the pause is. Uh, so Pete was asking about brave spaces and how might we be braver? And I'll, he also said, how might we be more effective? And I kind of want to riff on that. And in part, I want to do that by reading a poem into the space titled, an Invitation to a Brave Space, which is written by Mickey Scott Bay Jones. Uh, and it goes like this. Together we will create brave space because there is no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we all have caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We, ca we call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. It will not, it will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. And the link where I had this poem before was gone, so I found it in a PDF file that somebody had saved and put up. That's the best I've got. And I'm very intrigued by the question of how might we be braver? Uh, because we're cozy in our conversations here. Uh, when we talk about big things, it's not that we're organizing to go approach somebody about the big thing. Uh, I'll, and and in, in, in our private 
personal ambits. Uh, Mike is at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, he's got you know lots of people working on these things in very public spaces. Uh, Gil has been consulting about how do we fix the world with lots of orgs of people for a really long time. Uh, Klaus is involved in you know Sierra Club and a whole series of other things. So in our in our personal ambits, I think there's a lot of this going on. But how do we collectively uh, marshal ourselves uh, to do more? And I and I will say that I think I've not been very brave in the last five years in ways that I used to be. Um, and I'm wondering, like, what's up with that? Mm. Uh, and I'll go back to the queue and we can see where we are after Doug B and Gil. So I'd like to pick up the thread um, class that you alluded to about the people that are driving these massive platforms with massive influence and, and <laughs> effect. And just this morning, um, there was a news piece, Don Lemon um, cut a deal with X, with um, Elon Musk, for his podcast. And at the front end of that was uh, an interview of Elon Musk. And he sort of called out Musk on just about everything. But one of the key pieces of the puzzle was him asking him about the ap complete absence of, of moderation and violation of X's current terms of use related to hate speech. And didn't Musk feel some measure of responsibility for moderating that? And Musk's response to him was no. Just no. And, and the reason it was a no is because Elon Musk is neurodivergent as fuck. All that's happening right now is he is emerging and revealing himself as somewhat sociopathic. But he's always been without empathy. His first wife testified to it. Every employee he's ever had has testified to it after they've left his employee. So <clears throat> the, the projection that, and, and by the way, you know, Zuckerberg a little more a little more civilized in masking, but no different. Same, same deal. That blank stare is is a telltale. This is not like it's not complicated. So I the answer lies in the in the human beings part of this. It's like who's doing all this stuff? Who's making the decisions there's making they're making? And and how are they wired? And where did the where did the power control authority residing in, you know, the sociopathic get concentrated in how? And how did the vast majority of human beings become subject subjects and victims? So it, it's in the way we human. <laughs> and and I I do everything in my power to avoid invoking a we, but it is that. It is, you know, um, how to affect and catalyze awakening on that in, in that field of play. And and ultimately the masses win if they wake up. And I'm complete. Thanks, Doug. Mr. Friend, when you wish. Yeah. Um, Doug, listening to you reminds me of a film that came out, I don't know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, called The Corporation. Um, 
a really interesting doc about uh, about that. Ray Anderson from Interface was one of the people who fe featured in it. Uh, and one of the um, conclusions it drew or claims that it made was that if you analyze the modern corporation as though it was a person, you'd conclude that it was psychopathic by any of the traditional measures. And there are those who would say that people who aspire to power in this society are psychopathic by any measure. Maybe not everybody, but there's a tendency to that. Frank Herbert, I came across this quote yesterday, said, absolute power does not corrupt absolutely. Absolute power attracts the corruptible. So there's that. Um, yeah, thanks, Jerry. Um, where was I going to go with this? Um, Oh, yeah, so uh, Musk being neurodiverse as fuck. Uh, so there's a new hashtag for us there, you know, NDAF, new hashtag. Uh, neurodiversity is a funny thing in the popular culture, I guess the popular culture of the leftish folks, neurodiversity is seen as a good thing. Not necessarily, right? Um, neurodiverse, neurodiverse as fuck Musk, maybe not such a good thing. Um, it... It takes me back to John Kelly's suggestion at the top of the call about a competency test for presidents. Well, like, you know, by what standards decided by whom? The way we do that now is that it's decided by the voters. Imperfect system, but that's what you got. That's how we that's how we do trials with trial by jury of your peers. Gamed in all sorts of ways, but you know, what's the alternative? Um and um for me, the main reason I'm a fan of democracy rather than autocracy is Ross Ashby's law of requisite variety. You know, none of us is as smart as all of us. Um, so, uh, we're, and that was not what I raised my hand for <laughs> at some point. Uh, uh, but I guess I'll throw in, if we're, if we're going to be talking about um, TikTok, information wanted to be free, and all of that, um, I'm an old William O. Douglas kind of guy, you know, uh, Congress shall make no law restricting freedom of speech. That's where I start. Uh, but I also note that not only does the Chinese Communist Party use TikTok in a very different way in China than it does in the U.S., um, but so do Jobs and Zuckerberg and the other masters of the universe. Uh, who reportedly don't let their kids use the stuff that they sell to other people's kids. <clears throat> that should be telling. <laughs> and may, maybe eating your own dog food should be a requirement. Not just to me. Such uh, an unfortunate expression. It's an unfortunate expression, but it's like, um, it, 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 it's like, you know, kings used to have tasters to eat their meals before they did to make sure there was no poison in them. Um, maybe these, maybe folks who sell shit should be required to use it themselves. In China, they make the lead engineer for a railroad bridge be on the first train to go across. There you go. Basic what, cybernetics. Okay. What I'd heard, what I'd heard about uh, Roman construction is and that- Sometimes you... the last. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, you make the news that way. Um, in in the good old days of, of ancient Rome, they would build something like an arch structure, like an aqueduct or whatever else. And the engineer in charge of that span had to stand under the span when they removed the scaffolding. Yeah. Same Just thing with real, load, load real, masters real quick, in um, the U.S. Air Force. They have to pack a plane and then they turn the plane upside down with the load master sitting in the middle of the cargo. Go ahead. Real quick tangent on Roman engineering, I recently discovered that um, the aqueducts that the Romans built were designed to drop one inch in elevation for every hundred yards. Mm -hmm. And they did that without slide rules and, you know, all the fancy stuff we have. So it's just fascinating me to find that out. Um, Gil, are you done? Yes, I am. Sorry. Thanks. Jose, please. Um, maybe I have a different perspective, but the, I, I don't 
think the Chinese make us do what we do on TikTok. Um, we do what we do on TikTok because that's who we are. Um, what they're doing is trying to keep their kids from doing what we do. And, uh, and we've kind of sold to the world our view of, of what it means to be free, which means doing a lot of what we do. And, um, and I think a lot of the world is afraid of that. Uh, they're afraid that allowing their kids to simply do a lot of what we have, you know, giving our phones to the kids at such a young age, getting a dim addicted to, to these, uh, types of, um, of, I don't even know what to call them posts that are just rhythmic and, and just keep you, your system going. Um, I think that that's addictive as hell. And, and that, works because we've gotten really good at doing things that are addictive to people and we've built systems to support that addiction um so i i don't think that what we're seeing on tiktok as far as what china is doing is any different than what we've already done um but we've kept people dumb rather than trying to help people become smarter um and and that's been okay with us because having dumb voters doesn't really hurt us too much. Uh, we can manipulate them more. Um, and when I say we, I mean the the our electoral system doesn't necessarily need a whole bunch of smart people. They just need a whole bunch of people that watch TV so we can manipulate them. Um, I'm being pretty critical here, so I apologize for that. Um, it's hopefully a slightly brave space, so don't worry about that. But on the other hand, I think when we are afraid of their government having control of a system that so many of our youth are using, you know, back when I was in media, um, when our data center became big enough, the government asked us to put some servers in the data center. When I asked what the hell is all that about? And they go, well, once you get to a certain size data center, the government wants to put servers into the data center. Um, every data center of any scale has government servers at it. Our government servers. And so meaning that everything that comes in and out of our data centers is has the government has access to. Um, we're, we're not afraid of our own government having access to our data, but we're afraid of somebody else's government having access to our data. My sense is that when we look at it from a, um, a U.S. centric view, we're not seeing the big picture and the big picture I don't think has to do with. Uh, what a government is doing to another population, but what governments are doing to populations, our own and others. Um, and I think the idea of TikTok is not actually a good example of us finding freedom from another government, but more of another government finding freedom for their own people from other tools that are being uh, run by us, run by the U.S. mindset uh, globally. Um, so I think that's probably a little enough for me. Uh, that's fine, Jose. Thank you. Um, so I just want to, I might, I, you you caused a whole bunch of neurons to fire in my head, so I might have misunderstood some of what you were intending. I just want to maybe clarify a little bit. A, a piece of um, piece of uh, how I see these issues is that capitalism is kind of the problem. The reason we have these addictive platforms and all this other crap going on is capitalism. And when you say other other countries fear our freedoms, are you being ironic or are you being completely sincere? Because I think we're less free than we think we are. I think we're captive to 
the the sociopathic corporate mentality that the corporation showed up pretty well, which is sort of stereotypically what your average capitalist is trying to do. Like capitalism uh, gives people license and and shields them from punishment for doing things that are in many ways deeply antisocial. And we're seeing here the effects in 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 the superconducting social medium. Uh, the effects of that on our culture, on our elections, on everything else. And we're busy whining about, well, how do we protect ourselves? And Jonathan Haidt is like, well, take away the kids' smartphones. And I'm and I'm thinking, yeah, that's not that's not the that's not the right answer. The answer is to to actually subvert or somehow throw a, a sabot into the the mechanism that is causing all of this, that the forcing function that drives all of this behavior toward these outcomes. Right. I, I don't know exactly how to do that, but I'd love to figure out how to do that. I, I would be I'm happy to spend the rest of my days uh, figuring out how to break us out of that model. And I think that our remedies, the way we think we want to fix all these different kinds of things, often go wrong because we're trying to put a Band-Aid when we need like a tourniquet or an amputation. Ooh, that was a bad analogy. Um, <laughs> anyway. Maybe, uh, maybe not yeah, a wrong analogy. Maybe, maybe not, or, or maybe it's a lobotomy. No, not a lobotomy. It's <laughs> something else. But, but, but we're not dealing with the mechanism that's driving all of these problems. We're busy patching the problems that come up, and then the, those problems are nested, recursive, multiply reinforcing, and cause such a big ruckus that we can be distracted for the rest of our lives just patching the problems and trying to fix things, as Doug C said a little while ago. Thank uh, you for my, being clear with my, what my message was. So does that resonate for you? Thank you very much. And and thanks for putting that in the conversation. No need to apologize for it. That's what we're all about here. Um, Mike, then Stacy, then Gil, then Doug B. I, I'm going to be short, but I'm also going to try to be... Are you Robert Reich? <laughs> <laughs> That's the title of his biography. I'll be short. It is. It's great. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to be as uh, critical and cynical and provocative as, as Jose. Actually, I'll probably be three times more. Uh, and, and he said half of what I want to say, which is that in many cases, these platforms are not being controlled by some evil genius psychopath. Uh, they're being controlled by us. And he said it really well. The disinformation that was spouting all over the internet on social and particularly on social platforms in 2016 when Hillary Clinton was running was partly generated by a whole bunch of very hardworking creative Macedonian teenagers and they found out that when they did the Hill anti-Hillary stuff it got five or ten times the traction it was reposted everywhere by the the Trumpsters and so they just stopped doing the anti-Trump stuff because they got a lot more clicks with the anti-Hillary stuff. And, you know, they were happy to make money whichever way. I think the Chinese probably, I mean, they obviously have some things in their algorithms. Try to try to do an anti-China uh, TikTok video and see how far that gets you. But even the argument that they're showing us a lot of Gaza uh, footage and a lot of, you know, bloody children and, and trying to skew that debate is a little suspect because Americans have seen a lot about the challenges the Israelis have suffered for 20 or 30 years. There hasn't been as much coverage in the United States about this, the, the state of infrastructure and and life in, uh, in, in Gaza. So, you know, even people who are looking for both sides are probably clicking on a side that they don't know much about. So that's that's partly what we have to do is we have to change the thinking in these parliaments so that they do understand it's not just about some evil uh, CEO or evil Chinese government. It's there, it's also about training people to uh, look broadly, look beyond you know, what's popping up on their screen. The other thing um, I just wanted to throw into debate, um, Stacy said very well, one of the, the key points that is shaping the debate here, which is all about, you know, in, in the children being influenced and, and that that is a driver. The other driver is the idea that these platforms are sucking up our data 
And the fear is that you've got the totalitarian government with the ability to micro-target. And that's the most scary thing of all. That's the Venn diagram that, that I'm particularly upset about. But the, the, the thing that hasn't been mentioned very much, the, the statistic or the factoid that needs to get out there is that last year, Facebook sold data and targeting services to over 2,000 entities in China. And this wasn't $20 or $200 contracts. <laughs> and who knows how it was being used. So it's not just about TikTok being used by the Chinese to target us. And yet that, that doesn't get into the debate very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. I put my hand up specifically to ask the question, why is it that we trust corporate or corporations less than enemy governments? I mean, to me, they're both risks. I mean, I, I get, you know, yeah, no, I don't, that's it, I'm gonna say it. They are both risks. And I think it would be helpful if we didn't just apply standards to one and not the other, because that's where the masses crisscross in what they believe and wind up fighting each other for the sake of not us. <laughs> Go ahead, Gil, whenever you want. Well, I think we wound up with a pretty good topic today. Whatever, whatever it is that we would call this. But I'm unclear what the topic ended up crystallizing as, but I like the way we've been talking but, around it. But it's very juicy, and I think this one is going to be worth going back and harvesting a lot of stuff out of. Um, let me try to harvest a couple of things. Um, um, the micro-target is important because this is not just a matter of social influence on how American teenagers behave, but this is an intelligence-gathering apparatus of enormous potential with you know Facebook sale of data being just one example. Um, close to home, we want to trust corporations rather than foreign governments. Uh, recent press about automobile companies selling driving data to insurance companies and others. You never signed a consent form on that when you bought your car, but obviously you did. <laughs> it's in there somewhere. So the surveillance capitalism book that somebody mentioned in the chat is really worth relooking at. Zuboff uh, went deep uh, and very smart about that. It's it's scary and really important. Um, um, the Macedonian teenagers thing is fascinating because it's both an artifact of the system that we have. I mean, you know, like a bunch of smart kids discover they could do this thing and all of a sudden elections are changed. Yeah. On the other hand, there are the Russian bot shops and so forth. And there is an article, uh, hope maybe somebody here can find it, but I think it was from 2015 or 2016, quoting Putin extensively talking about shredding the social fabric of America as part of his geopolitical strategy. And I don't know if that's a fabrication of my fever dreams, but I really think I saw something about that that I have not been able to find. Um, so it points to the challenge that we have, which I've been sorely aware of lately, of dealing with multivalent situations. There's, you know, everybody's trying to figure out it's either this or it's that. But it could be both. And other things, too. And being able to make wise decisions in the face of complexity seems to be a very challenging skill. Um, we see it with the Israel, Israel Gaza stuff. It's like, you know, either Israel is evil or Hamas is evil. Well, maybe Hania and Netanyahu are both maniacs. What do you do? It's a different kind of question. Um, and so, and I and I feel we have that here. It's 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 a complex mess. Uh, Doug B, I, Doug, Doug C, I guess is gone, but you know, it's not the kind of thing you can fix. Uh, it doesn't stay fixed, at least. But you know, maybe we can improve a little bit in a beneficial direction. I don't know. And I got a cat war happening in the next room. Let me go stop that. <laughs> <laughs> Doug B. So I, I just wanted to turn the telescope around for a minute on TikTok. Um, TikTok is the home of a whole new market that I would call the persona economy. 
And what nobody seems to be thinking about is literally, I suspect, if not a million, a hun hundreds of thousands of micro entrepreneurs who are in their living just being on TikTok. And you pull the plug on that. What happens to unemployment? And by the way, they're not organized in companies paying themselves payroll. They don't qualify for unemployment insurance. Um, staggering numbers of them are making really significant livings and exponentially more are making enough to live on and provide for their families and all of that. And you pull the plug on their means of earning and um, it's a complete wild card off the map of the economists and the standard indicators for um, the economy at large and its state uh, and um, potential for changes and instability. But nobody knows the scale of the impact of pulling the plug on all those people, their incomes, their lives with them having literally no safety net or anything to fall back on. Um, mostly because we have no national health care. I mean, we have no all sorts of things, but I mean, yeah. we, we just, don't, nobody's looking at that or measuring that or projecting like, what if, and if this legislation actually went through um, and if, uh, the parent company didn't divest and they were trying to turn it off. Um, it's a pretty staggering thing. And, and, um, and not, you know, not for nothing, but independent of judgment, it's a really powerful economic innovation that's generated that potential for all of those people to create and to leverage their persona and leverage their talents and leverage their cooking skills and leverage their fashion sense. And my, my niece, who's, you know, a wannabe influencer, makeup artist. Like, I don't know what she would do without that. <laughs> so, you know, cup half full, cup half empty. I'm, I'm complete. <laughs> Thank you for making that point, which we've kind of slide, slid past. Across. Yeah, one thought that comes to mind is the very nature of um, how corporations really function inside the corporation. So I spent uh, some over 30 years working in uh, very large uh, companies. It's sort of a senior director level, mid-level uh, kind of role. Um, and what happens is that every year, sort of in April, you get a five-year plan. Um, and on that five-year plan, your business unit is a line item. And it says you need to increase your profit by 8%. And it says so five years in a row, um, since you arrived in this, in this, uh, business unit and you have squeezed out everything that you can think of squeezing and you have no else nowhere else to go so now you have to think okay so what else can i do and then some some crazy things come to mind um and when you translate that into areas i mean for example i had to do socially responsible merchandising for children for you know worldwide uh theme parks and partner with coca-cola and nestle well guess where nutrition ended up on that discussion right so that's just like a harmless thing but think about people who um manage credit cards you know and and how uh, the overcharges are applied or you have all heard the stories about you know uh, uh, bank accounts being forced on you know, unsuspecting consumers and so on so all of these things really don't originate in senior management they originate with senior management saying you need to you shall increase your profit for next year by eight percent and you get paid to figure out how to do this 
and then there is like no moral guideline, no compass, nothing is off limits, right? So you end up coming up with some crazy stuff, which um, you couldn't, I mean, but why are you even thinking about this? It's not improving your product. It's not improving your service. It's just scoring your customer, basically. But that's what you end up doing. So then now you 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 extrapolate this across the entire company, you know, and you have the top guys squeezing this thing down uh, and uh, uh, demanding that much more profit. <laughs> and you have the essence of capitalism. There is no bad intention here, right? It's not like there's some evil genius uh, who uh, uh, is thinking about uh, running this ship into strange directions. No, it's just money. You know? Increase your profit line. And I, I've done some weird stuff uh, in the food business, and I'm you know horrified to think back about uh, on it. And anybody else, you know, my partner, same thing. He's in the biotech industry. He's, I mean, everyone has horror stories about. Oh my God, I can't believe what I did. You know? And Jerry, you're right. That should be uh, triggering something on Zoom. This should totally be a, a, a Zoom thing. Yep, yep. Like like a little space laser should show up from the side or something, or a Bob's big boy. I you know, whatever. Judy, great to see you. And you're muted. You need to unmute. I automatically mute because my house phone is loud. <laughs> um, I'm I'm kind of coming from where Klaus is. I mean, I was fortunate to work for 3M which was innovation driven, but it needed to be profitable. The priority was be innovative enough that it's something new that people want to buy. And then you can price it in an effective way and maintain reasonable margins for a long time. Even in divisions like tape, which are 75 years old, if you have good tape and people know it's better than other tape, they'll buy yours instead of someone else's. But I think, what bothers me is this sort of, I don't know, the selective interference aspect of what's being discussed. Because if one organization like TikTok is um, stifled because of legislative action and it's a collection of individuals, it feels to me like it's eroding the sense of independence and freedom that has been a part of our culture for a long, long time and changing the playing field. I mean, it, it's not illegal. <laughs> it's, it's not the sort of thing where you're protecting because of crime or other things from my perspective, but maybe I'm looking at it wrong, but it just, it feels like it's coming out of left field and it makes me very uncomfortable. Thanks, Judy. Anybody feel strongly about that or want to shed light on the subject? Perhaps not. Um, so what do we do about this uh, thorny bramble? I, I have a a, a topic which seems like it's related to the whatever topic we're talking about but Sounds it comes great. from a different tangent awesome um uh because i have a interest in military hardware um even though i don't like that it gets used um uh, one of the things on my drip feed of news is the drone wars and drone and other wars uh front lines in uh, between the ukraine and russia um and it's hard not to root for the U Ukrainian underdogs, but um, but but pretty regularly, you know, it'll say, well, you know, there's they're starting. The Russians have figured out a new tactic. They figured out how to unsnarl their information lines, getting sensor data back to um, commanders that will al allow strikes. Um, so, you know, today I read about uh, two helicopters getting destroyed, which wouldn't have happened in the olden days. Um, because of the way the Russians, uh, you know, prosecute war. Um, so the Russians have gotten a little bit more like the Ukrainians and are able to de make decisions faster to destroy things that should get destroyed in their view. 
Um, another one is, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. sent over a bunch of M1 tanks um, and uh, Russia is starting to destroy those uh, more frequently. So the, 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 the places I read this is military hardware blogs, I guess. Um, and it comes down to the end and it's like, well, get used to seeing more of these kinds of losses because the, you know, the Republican Congress has decided that to starve uh, Ukrainian from artillery and arms. And I'm like, is that, why, why did the U.S. decide that, <laughs> you know, why is it uh, consistently deciding to like look the other way as Russia, you know, does things like pound our social media or, or pound uh, mm -hmm. Ukraine, you know, it's like, I, I didn't vote that way. You know, I, I wouldn't vote that way. Um, so it's, it's just interesting that it feels like we have a, you know, pro-Russia contingent in, in Congress. And that's kind of letting us decide what we do uh, to support an ally, a potential ally. There's a great mystery afoot, which is maybe not that mysterious, why one party in this country seems to have gone from the anti-commie party, including McCarthyism, et cetera, uh, and, you know, Goldwater, uh, there's this long and I'm not sure the word honorable fits here tradition of, uh, you know, fighting against communism to being the pro-communist party. And they are doing they're they're doing everything they can uh, to throw. Uh, I, I, I watched uh, yesterday morning. My first call was a webinar about the Ukraine situation two years in. And the the guy who was the expert, the Russia expert, said uh, stepping on the stepping on the hose is going to really help Russia. And I, I thought the stepping on the hose metaphor was really good. <clears throat> it was just right on. Uh, Doug C. Then Jose. Uh, you're Doug, you're muted. muted. You're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, it seems to me that we've got too many people and each person has access to being a node and every node is a lever into the information space. And any attempt to push down on one place is going to make things rise up in another. Uh, and until we deal with a large number problem, uh, we're not going to get very far, except into more trouble. Until and, we deal with which problem? Uh, uh, too many people, too many nodes, too many levers in the information space. But that's just how the world, how the way the world is, is it yeah, not? But that's ex let's name it, the, and so we're not obscure about it. It is the way the world is. All right. Um, I, I would love, in in the interest of smaller things, we can't affect probably in the near term. I would love to know, Pete, how to convince the far right in the US to let go and start helping Ukraine save itself. Uh, like the, the guy yesterday morning made a really convincing argument that, and he didn't need to convince me, but a really convincing argument that if Ukraine falls, there's a whole bunch of other things that Putin would like to attack next, that that he's not going to, he really isn't going to stop. And, and this from a person who firmly believes that the Vietnam War uh, for which one of the pretexts was the domino theory that if Vietnam fell, then the next thing would be the Philippines, then the next thing would be Hawaii, um, that the, the domino theory was entirely wrong headed and stupid, and that the Vietnam War was entirely avoidable. And I've got longer stories I can tell about that. So I, I, I believe that firmly. But I, uh, I also believe that if Ukraine uh, is even even some kind of truce arrangement that doesn't defang Putin, uh, is not a workable truce. Will not will not actually function, uh, and Putin can be trusted in no way at any point for anything. Anyway, um, Scott, good to not see you, but good to have you here. Um, there you are, Shabing. Go for it. Presto technology. Presto changeo. So, um, Doug got my brain working as he often does. Thank you, Doug. So my response to that whole too many nodes thing, which seemed to kind of throw us off guard a little bit, because what do you do about that? Too many nodes, 
in the information space, I agree. I also agree with your assertion that that's reality. So the question to me, based on my new understanding of systems thinking and systems being only four things from the DSRP mindset, part whole into groups. So in order to deal with too many nodes in a space, you have to aggregate. And that's what, you know, there's lots of different ways to aggregate nodes because that's what we do. We, we, we don't go one on one because it's too many. You can't do 9 billion, right? You have to, you have to chunk and every aggregation is a part whole grouping from a perspective. There's lots of reasons why that's true, but that's, so, so what you have is that how do you, how do you group? And all those parts can be parts of multiple groups, but at some point it's rolling up to either us and them, right or left. It seems to be rolling up to two groups <laughs> at the top, which feels like it's, we, we've, we have all these wonderful distinctions that are way too many to possibly process as an individual person, but then they get grouped up into things that might be useful and relevant to us locally, uh, various interests, various concerns, and then they get grouped up again into two factions that are going like that. And it's it's just an interesting thing to consider. I think the response to too many nodes is, well, how do you choose to aggregate them in a meaningful way where you don't lose too much of the nuance, but you also don't turn it into binary? A thought. Um, Scott, thank you. And, and I think a piece of what I see happening a lot is, a, you know, knife fight in an elevator over what the frameworks are by which we roll up and generalize about the world. And I just put in, you know, red states, blue states, capitalism, socialism. There's a whole bunch of these kind of binaries that, that we get marketed. Uh, and that become a given or a part of the conversation and that often undermine the conversation. And there's very interesting conversation, uh, like um, Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast and the movie Origin. She's making this argument that, hey, caste is the actual problem. Racism is a special instance of caste issues. And caste generalizes to other things. And I'm like, that that was really helpful for my reframing uh how i look at some of those issues right and that that was i think in the dsrp model uh a, an intelligent offer for a how to group things or or cluster things uh so I, I i really appreciated the movie for for making the point as as well as a movie might make an academic point um gil then judy then jose then doug c Perhaps I have no idea what I was going to talk about. Awesome. I've been uh, distracted by a data center energy rat hole. Yeah, I, I saw <laughs> you've been you've been fencing in the in the chat. Got, and I thank got, you for doing that, Gil. I got snagged. Sorry. Cool. Uh, Judy. Well, I'd just like to follow up on what you said, Jerry. I mean, I find that the world is not binary, but people want to simplify it all the time to make it binary for the purposes of contrast. And the only way that I've found to deal with it is to not respond to the binary, but ask how something that isn't binary fits in that continuum. And sometimes that conversation goes in a slightly different direction. Um, but I think that we're all suffering nationally, particularly here from a binary mentality that's sort of an either or, and both extremes are unacceptable. And that just immobilizes people in their course of action. And when they're big issues, like sociopolitical ones, it's not satisfying to tackle them on the local level, but it's not effective to tackle them on anything else. <laughs> and it's a source of frustration that I have a concern causes people to disengage to just say, well, I'm just gonna kind of tough it out because I can't do anything about it. And that's not how progress gets made. And so 
this balance between simplicity and tension and the challenges of change is something worthy of deeper thought. And I haven't studied it, I, I confess, um, but I'm concerned as are most of you. That is all because there are two kinds of people. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, the ones I like and the ones I don't. <laughs> when, when, I, when I hear arguments that the world is getting more and more complex, I kind of grimace because the world has always been really complex, but never before have we been able to like witness so much of the complexity all at once pouring into our senses. Like th that's true, that's new. But I would not have stayed. I would not have been able to stay alive had I been born in you know 900 A.D. Um, uh, unless I'd been born into a family that knew what was up and how to take care of business. And, and you know, every, life has been really complicated from the get-go. The, the world, the universe is complicated. Um, we just have visibility into so much more of it now that, um, that we're overwhelmed the way Doug C. brought into the conversation. There's too many nodes or too many notes, if I can quote from Amadeus. Um, and we don't know how to cope with that, so we oversimplify. Uh, Scott, go ahead. Just, just a quick uh, extension of something I was going to say about the, we don't know how to simplify. And one of the things, one of the problems with part whole thinking when we, when we group things together is that we get locked into the group that we've made. And we forget that it's Lego pieces that we've put together. And then we can take them apart and put together in a different way. Or this, this piece is part of multiple groups. And where it's natural, it's essential to simplify and group things together. It's the only way we can deal with anything around us. You don't, you don't drive twelve thousand parts. You drive a car. You know that that's how it works. But we forget that when I have a, made a group, that's a group from a perspective. If you change the perspective, you change what that group is or what it could be or the, the parts disassemble and are reassembled and that's where i think we've lost it is that we get locked in on the group that that we uh, know or have or are presented with thanks scott and apropos the membership thing the we get we go into groups one of my favorite thoughts in my brain is emotion and membership trump reason most of the time and stories are the vessel um, and we, we do not want to be excluded from our tribe. We don't want to be shunned by our neighbors. We do not. And, and when all of your neighbors are flying Trump flags and, and doing whatever, it looks like everybody in the world is doing that. And why would you go against that? Uh, Judy, did you want to jump back in the conversation or is your hand just... No, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to okay. take it down. That's okay. Thanks. Just checking. Um, Gil. Yeah, um, Scott, appreciating what you said, uh, you know, I, I don't drive 12,000 parts, I drive a car, uh, but somebody makes 12,000 parts. Uh, somebody makes each and every one of them with great detail and precision. And this echoes for me, um, McGilchrist's phenomenal book, The Master and His Emissary, uh, which is a deep dive into the science of, of, of the divided brain uh, in humans and other critters. And to... Um, uh, uh, highly recommended read. He's going to be doing a three-day thing in San Francisco later this month. But the basic gist is that, um, to oversimplify it, is that most of most of what you heard about left brain, right brain stuff in the 90s was wrong. It's not masculine, feminine. It's not, you know, linguistic versus not. But what he argues is that, is that um, left brain is oriented to discrete things that we can understand in a particular context, and right brain tends to be integrative, associative, broader awareness, and you need both for evolutionary survival. Um, and we are in a society where left is very dominant to the loss of some of the uh, integrative functions of right brain. Um, and that's, you know, it, this is like a, you know, there's a many hundred page book uh, followed by The Matter with Things, which is a 1500 page book. Uh, deep, um, um, fascinating science, uh, eloquent, and um, I think informs the conversation that we're having here in a very important way. And I would I would recommend that as something for us to dive into more in a future conversation. I'm awesome, back. thank you. Did you throw that in the chat? Guys, I can't write fast enough. <laughs> uh, you muted yourself, Gil. 
I've thrown I've thrown the title in the chat and I'll try to find the link to the event. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Stacy, then Jose, and then we're getting close to the end of our call. Following the thread from Scott to Judy to you, Jerry, I think this goes back to last week, the notion of finding the difference within the same and not so much with our neighbors and their Trump flags, but right in this conversation right here. So like, and that also touches on brave spaces and it also touches on too many nodes. So in the chat, um, for ex this is as an example, Ken, asked, Ken said something or asked a question I don't remember, and Mike was able to respond to it, which was very interesting information that could really be flushed out. To me, that's its own node. That should be a separate thing. It's, it's so much hard. The closer you are to people, the harder, the more brave, the more courage is needed to be able to find the differences within the same. It's really hard, trust me. It's so scary and hard. I can't even, I, I mean, I could rate every call I go into and tell you how brave do I feel I have to be in that space. It's a different level of braveness for every space. So just wanted to say that. Thank you. Jose. Jose. Uh, thank you for that, Stacey. Um, I, I tried to get in, in the queue a couple of times and somehow I got lost. But, oh, sorry um, about that. The, uh, and so now it's like what I wanted to say has, has maybe uh, faded. But um, you talked about why is it that uh, certain sectors of our society have been against uh, communism and now they're pro-communism. Um, I don't think they're pro-communism. Um, they're pro a leader who thinks that the Russians are no longer our enemy. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and they're pro a leader who thinks that um, the, the Bidens were involved with, uh, uh, with Ukraine. And so, you know, poof, we now have a story and a narrative that that changes that. And I think that that's part of what we have um, continued to miss as a way to engage with these topics. It's not the thing that is reality, but the story that it is uh, pervasive about that thing or those things. And so the stories about TikTok, the stories about communism, the stories about not communism, they're all held by people who trust other people. And none of us actually have a real true sense for ourselves of what any of this means. We just simply adopt other people's stories. Um, none of us have done the experiments. None of us have lived in those environments or very few of us have. Um, and so everything that I believe and that we probably closely believe has come from our community. And everything that they, that they have uh, experienced and believed has come from their community. And I don't think that we're, that we can look at this from an objective perspective. I think we need to look at this from stories and what is the story that everybody's talking about and how do we talk about stories that are different that help rather than um, objective ways of viewing this and, and judging uh, on that basis. I'm done. Thank you. Well said. Um, yeah. Um, Mr. Homer, Master Homer, have you a poem for us? Well, Mike just said stories and poems. So, Mike, speaking of poems, here we go. A little more Vizdava Zimborska. Yay. Life While You Wait. Life While You Wait. Performance without rehearsal. Body without alterations. Head without premeditation. I know nothing of the role I play. I only know it's mine. I can't exchange it. 
I have to guess on the spot just what this play is all about. Ill prepared for the privilege of living, I can barely keep up with the pace that the action demands. I improvise, although I loathe improvisation. I trip at every step over my own ignorance. I can't conceal my hasty manners. My instincts are for hammy histrionics. Stage fright makes excuses for me, which humiliate me more. Extenuating circumstances strike me as cruel. Words and impulses you can't take back. Stars you'll never get counted. Your character, like a raincoat that you button on the run. The pitiful results of all of this unexpectedness. If I could just rehearse one Wednesday in advance, or repeat a single Thursday that has passed. But here comes Friday with a script I haven't seen. Is it fair? I ask, <clears throat> my voice a little hoarse since I couldn't even clear my throat off stage. You'd be wrong to think it's just a slapdash quiz taken in makeshift accommodations. Oh no, I'm standing on the set. I see how strong it is. The props are surprisingly precise. The machine rotating the stage has been around even longer. The furthest galaxies have been turned on. Oh no, there's no question. This must be the premiere. And whatever I do will be forever what I have done. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. On a personal note, I was an actor in school from fourth grade through college, and I haven't acted in years. So this is a little chance for me to buff up my acting chops. I, I love doing this reading a lot, and I'm so grateful that people appreciate it. Thank you. It really warms my heart. Yeah. We need a little Zoom animation that gives you like curtains and a proceeding. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> lights, limelights coming up from below like that. Yeah, cool. get my good side, will you? Yeah. Thanks, all. That was a great call. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Appreciate Did it. we ever get a topic? No, no. <laughs> all right. Next time, I think we should try and answer I the question, what do you do with a drunken sailor? We got a very good topic. It's, you know, <laughs> us versus them. The, no, but all... We had a topic. We didn't have a... Thank you, a... Mike. Yes. We don't know what to call the topic, but we had a topic. Yeah, yeah. We I have a, a quick question on a topic. Yeah. It, it might be interesting to pick something that's a bit elusive and ephemeral and then ask everyone to bring something resource wise to a discussion about that topic. Because I find that I struggle to take notes on a bunch of stuff when I'm doing things to try to remember that I should go read X or Y. But if we want to actually make change happen, we need to understand it from the complex dimensions that the people on this call would represent from a different viewpoint and a different set of life experiences. And that might be a very rich opportunity. You have just caused two people to want to answer what you're saying. So let's go Gil and Mike. Just real quickly, Judy, yes, thank you. We tend to go very fast here. And so a little bit of reflection and prep would be great. Um, I encourage you safe chat uh, before Jerry takes it away because there's a lot in there. So I post the video, the chat, and my brain notes all to the Mattermost channel. So they're all there for all of our calls. I also have them Thank all. Thank you, Jerry, because I'm not as good with the computer as you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I know um, you do that, Jerry, but I, I like to grab the chat so I have it right now as opposed to finding that later if I ever get there. I don't yeah, know how you, to grab the whole chat. <laughs> if you update to the latest version of Zoom, it automatically saves it for you. Every time I get off, it opens a window in my finder says, here's where the chat is. So I no longer even have the three dots to save it. So, I, okay. so Judy, Judy, there's, Judy, there's three dots in the chat somewhere. Either the uh, actually, it is. It's at the very top now. Judy, what kind, of what kind of device are you on Zoom? With? I'm actually on a tablet, so it might be different. That's what I thought. It's probably different on a tablet. Is it, is it an iPad or somebody else's tablet? iPad. There's a three dot. There's a three dots somewhere in your chat. Okay, let the me top of the screen. back to it again. And Mike, you were going to go next, I think. I had a process question too. Yes. Um, I've got about three people I'd like to coerce, entice to join this call, either for once or for ongoing. Is there anybody I shouldn't invite? 
or do I have to kind of check with you first or no, 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 no. Just uh, forward the invite. Uh, all people free to come. We've only had trouble with participants a couple times and those were interesting and thorny, but, but yeah, uh, please invite okay. everybody. And I will, uh, I, I will sort of imply that this is, you know, a special event that you should really come to. And, and if they uh, then come back and say, could I join, then we have that question but are we yeah. are we gonna have to dress nicer oh no 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 okay not those kind of people you might have to shower though ah. is it the same for the democracy call i mean or is that you're finishing that up now Does right that mean i yeah. have to get hair done or something i know <laughs> new coiffure well you'll notice uh, i keep going back to my my uh my glamour shot every so often that that's partly because <laughs> i'm having some connectivity problems but it's also because i do want to be presentable and remind people i can wear a suit Sweet. Sweet. I sort of delight in the fact that I hardly ever need to now. So uh, I don't yeah. think I own a suit that fits anymore. I think they're all. Blah. Well, thank you, Jerry. And it's glad I'm glad that open global mind is truly open. And uh, we'll go with that. Thank well, you very much. And so the, the last of the four democracy calls happens in at the top of the hour. I'll, nice. see, I'll, some, I'll see some of you then. Thanks. Jerry, all. Could you stay um, on for just a second afterwards? Yes. Thank you.